Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. So glad to be here. And uh, Kevin gave a fantastic aerial view about our economy and innovation. I'm going to go 10,000 feet down and uh, really at the very ground floor level of entrepreneurship. Uh, okay. Cool. So the topic that I want to talk about is uh, the building blocks of entrepreneurship. And I'm going to talk about some of the core underlining principles that cuts across any entrepreneurial ventures. So you'll get to see how you actually build a company from the ground up. Uh, I have built about three companies over the last 15 years, so I do have something to share here. And uh, hopefully I can uh, talk with some, uh, some insights. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a computer science engineer. Uh, just like many of you uh, immigrants, I came to this country 15 years back with less than uh, $300 in my pocket, which is enough to survive for 30 days in America. Uh, over the last 15 years, uh, built, as I mentioned, three companies uh, with several hundred millions of dollars of uh, exit value for my investors, for my partners, uh, for my employees and co-founders. And uh, what I'm passionate about is that you know, wealth creation is not just about money, so that's very important. As we go through this presentation about, you know, entrepreneurship, building businesses, building multi-billion dollar value, uh, want to keep in mind that we stay grounded, that it's not about money, but it's all, it's about creating the wealth so that we can help the society, we can, you know, give it back to the community. My passion is about how to use technology and how to use entrepreneurship, so the two big tools that we have to make a difference to about, four billion people who are living in the bottom of the pyramid, and they're all living for under $10 a day, which is the place where I was 15 years back, $300 a month. So what is, uh, how do you go about building businesses? And there are five, or mainly four stages that you are going to go through when you, when you start building a business. And I've gone through this multiple times, and I'm going to share with you some key insights. We can talk about this topic for hours and days, but given the 20-minute format here, I'm going to talk about just the key insights that I have learned over and over again. And they kind of repeat uh, across ventures, and it's not really specific to any particular industry, because I've done, uh, my first business was in hardware business, the second business was a mobile, uh, mobile software business, and the third most recent business was a payment technology for gaming, online gaming and social media. Uh, a lot of games that you guys play on Facebook are powered by my, my product and my technology when you're buying Facebook credits. So those are the principles that cuts across any industry and any business that you would, that you would build. So really, we're going to focus on uh, four different uh, aspects. So initially, you're going to have to, when you're starting a business, which is founding stage, and in the founding stage, how do you come up with an idea? How do you come up with an innovation, and, and, and an innovation which is disruptive enough to help you propel into something which is building a real company around that idea? And we're going to talk about some how do you get started. A lot of people ask me that you come up with three different ideas in three different industries. How do you actually get those ideas? And we'll talk about that. The second stage is that assuming that you know, your, ideas is, your idea is good enough to build a business around it, then you're going to have to build the business. And how do we go around building a company or building a business around that idea? The third thing is that you know, assuming that your product has a market, uh, you're going to need funding because you need money to grow your business. So we'll talk about some of the lessons learned and key insights about funding the business. And the fourth thing is that you're lucky enough to get through all of that, you'll have to scale your business into something very big, like what you've seen how Facebook has grown into a really big business very, in a very short time. Assuming all those four things go well, and then you know, obviously the fifth thing is that you make enough money, you want to give back to the society, so which is giving back. So let's talk about each one of the stages that you're going to go through. So founding. It's really, you know, how does entrepreneurs come up with an idea? So you got to dare to dream. You know, someone has rightly said that, you know, an entrepreneur, you know, the, what's the definition of an entrepreneur? Who is an entrepreneur? Is someone who dares to dream, but more important is someone who is foolish enough, oops, who is foolish enough to pursue and try those dreams out. So how many of you here dare to dream to become like Steve Jobs when you graduate from college? All of you? Yeah, that's great, right? But how many of you are foolish enough to believe that you can become Steve Jobs? 
Great, right? So it's very important because generally when we set very high dreams for ourselves, I think there is our conditioned mind which is telling us that, uh uh, you know, I can't do this, right? But then you have to be foolish enough to say, no, I'm going to do it. So that's very, very important. That's the first lesson of entrepreneurship that, you know, you have to have the courage and the daring to dream, and then you have to be foolish. And Steve Jobs has said this in his Stanford speech. I don't know how many of you have uh, seen that, but that's stay hungry and stay foolish. So that's a very important lesson. Now, how do you really come up with an idea? So there are really two, um, two aspects of coming up with a new idea, and I call this kind of the framework of an innovation that I have used multiple times, which is I call it in two ways. One is inside out, and another is outside in. So what I mean by inside out is that, you know, there is one, uh, one way to bring up great ideas in the world is that inside you, you have, you have passion or talent, some kind of a passion you have about something, and you want to bring that passion out and express that and manifest that in the outside physical world, right? The great example for that is, you know, taking a talent, like let's take an example of Amazon. So Amazon, we all know, is, a, is, an electron, is an online retailer. But they had a great talent or they had a great passion for web technologies. And they innovated and they came up with this idea, a very radical idea, to take that technology and become an Amazon Web Services, which is a completely different business. But that's an example of an innovation of taking a talent that is inside and it has no relation with what you're doing today, but you're taking that outside in the outside world. World. The second way of innovating is that if you think that, uh oh, you know, I really don't, I'm not, I, I don't know whether I'm passionate about anything or I really do I have any talent. The, there's another way to innovate, which is outside in. And the outside in model is that what you do is you look at the outside world and you see all the problems and you say, I really want to solve this problem, whether it is clean water for people or whether it is electric city, and then I'm going to figure out what is the right solution, I'm going to build a team around it, and I'm going to solve that. So regardless of the talent that you have, regardless of the passion that you have, you can still innovate because you are really driven by a problem in the outside world. So I hope you're getting the inside out and the outside in model. Now, you know, in the outside-in model, there is an opportunity to create millions of startups. Each one of you can become massively successful entrepreneurs because think about this. You know, we're living in the world today where 4 billion people on this planet do not have access to clean water. That alone, that just one single problem is good enough to create 1 million startups and you can be all very successful. So there are enough problems to solve in the world to become successful regardless of, you know, what your passion is. Now, the other, uh, I will give examples about just some key insights uh, about what I have done. So in the inside out, I have done hybrid models, which is inside out, outside in. So my most recent company was PlaySpan, which was recently acquired by Visa for over $200 million. And what we did is we built a company where there was no market. We sold goods that didn't really exist in the physical world. But what we did is we created a model which was based on innovation of inside out and outside in, which means what we did is we looked at the problems of the game developers who were building games and they don't know how to monetize, how to make money. And can we give them a technology to be able to price in a very, very small units, which is like 10 cents or 20 cents, and give them that micropayment technology and using the inside out, which is the talent, the software talent that I have to put together a product or a, or a business around it. So that is an example of kind of a hybrid model. The other example that I've been very much passionately involved is outside in inside out, which is a company called Simpa Networks that I'm, I'm part of it. And I'm, I'm an investor and a board member. And where three guys have come together and really are solving the problem of energy inequality. And let me uh, tell you a little bit about that. By the way, this is the the, 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 the play span, I don't know if you have used any one of these online games where you would use some of our technologies to buy virtual items and virtual goods uh, in a number of social and online games. Now, at Simpa, what we are doing is we are looking at this pyramid and we are saying that it's very expensive to be poor because 1.6 billion people on this planet do not have electricity. They do not have the grid. And what are they using? They are using very, very environmentally very poor choices for, it, for energy, which is $50 billion is being spent on kerosene, which is very highly polluting, candles, batteries, things like that. So what we put together, you know, the three founders and, and, and uh, you know, the guys that I'm backing, is put together a portable solar technology. So this is a great example of an innovation where we can put together a portable solar system and plug it in into a slums area, in remote areas, 
and without any installation, and immediately people can get very clean power, which is zero carbon footprint, right? And making it so cheap because we make it pay as you go, so we're not even charging those customers because they're so poor that they can't even afford to pay $2,000 for the system. So we are giving it away for free and using a cell phone model of they buying energy credits. So what we've created something, an innovation thing, is energy credits. So you're all familiar with Facebook credits that helps you buy all these virtual items on Facebook. We've created something called as energy credits where these poor people, they work all day in, in uh, you know, they do the labor work, come back, and they can use $2 and buy energy credits, X amount of wattages, they plug in the number into our system here, you know, punch it into the keypads, and they get energy. So this is, these are some few examples. This is how the system works in, in very, very remote areas. So these are the examples of how you actually innovate and put together an idea at the founding stage. Now let's, uh, let's look at the next stage, which is how do you build a company, assuming that you've got a great idea that has value for your customers. So there is a few things which are very important. There's many, many things that you do at this stage. But the number one thing is the founding team. That's very important. So the founding team, you have to put together a team that is going to work with you as a part of your, you know, as your entrepreneurial venture. And the most important thing here is this, that you have to hire people who are smarter than you. And that's very hard to do because that requires surrendering the ego. You know, generally when you're at a founding stage, you know, it's very easy for individuals to have ego, but you have to find the, you know, that what are your weaknesses and you need to complement those weaknesses. And seldom you will find individuals who are well-rounded, but generally only teams are well-rounded. So you have to understand your blind spots, figure out people, find people who will cover your blind spots and put together a team. The other thing is as you grow, go, as you keep building the business, you're going to find that only the core founding team that came together initially, they are really passionate and working hard. The people that you're going to hire later on, they will come, they will go, they will move on, they get a job at Google, they will move on, they are not going to stick around. Okay, and so it is very important that you are not alone in this journey. Very important to get two or three or four people as a part of the founding team. If you see the greatest companies in the world like Apple or even Microsoft, they had multiple founders. And there is a stats that has been done by some uh, you know, entrepreneurial uh, you know, uh, courses in some university where they found that companies that has more than one founder have higher probability of success than a company that has only one founder because you're going to wear out very fast. So that's a very important lesson that I've learned. The next thing is, once you put together, a t there's an idea, there's a team. The third thing is you've got to put a product. And the most important thing here is MVP. This is a concept called minimum viable product. Because all of us, when we start with an idea, we always come up with a big vision idea. But you know, from an execution standpoint, 90% of the startups fail. I, I'm sure you guys have heard the stats. I think it's more than 90%. And, the, and a lot of time, they fail because they can't execute at the very smallest level. You will have to chop it down, 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 down your idea into something very, very minimum viable, you know, a very small set of features and specifications that can create a product that you can give it in the hands of your customer, and they can test it, give you enough feedback, and then you iterate. So think about, like, you know, if you're thinking, I want to build the next big electric car after Tesla, don't think about you know, setting up an electric car plant. Think about you know, the smallest little unit. Can you improvise the battery technology in the car and just focus on that small, minimum viable product? If you come up with a better battery, oper you know, battery charging mechanism, if you come up with a better inverter, that is going to get you started and make successful. And over the time, yeah, you can accomplish your vision of building a car. But you have to bring it down to the very smallest unit. The, Third thing, and this is the last thing, there's many things here in, in the building stage, but it's the company culture. What I have seen is this, that as you start with your new businesses, you, your business plan is going to change, your product's going to change, your market's going to change, but one thing that is going to determine the success is really the company culture. If you build a culture that is set in with your founding team, with your four or five guys, about hard work, about success, about high quality, all that just the cultural thing, Eventually, you will be successful. Maybe your, your first product will fail. Maybe the first market that you go after was not the right market. But that culture is there for constantly innovating, setting the highest bar. You will eventually get it at the right, you will arrive at the right stage. So company culture, super, super important. That's the final bottom line. Assuming you got through all this, so now you got an idea, you got a company, you have to get it funded. And there are some lessons learned here about funding. So the number one thing that I feel very strongly about is Oops. Yeah, is you have to be, number one, your own investor. So this is a very important lesson, which is 
being, you know, ability to bootstrap. And I call this as your grandma's retirement savings test. If you are not willing to put your grandma's retirement money, even some small piece of that money into your business, that means you don't believe in your own idea. And I think it's very important for an entrepreneur to put some money of their own, no matter how little it is, because I think that's going to drive you. I've, I've experienced this, it drives your passion more hard, because now you're putting your own money, you're driven, you're more committed than ever. Uh, it's not just about ideas, but it's about really putting your money on it. So that's very important to get started with. That's also going to help you as you go to other investors and outside people, because they're going to see your commitment. The, Next thing is angels and VCs. So we're lucky to be in Silicon Valley. I think every, you know, every third neighbor where you live in Silicon Valley is probably an angel investor. Okay? <laughs> and uh, you're gonna, if you go to any parties in Silicon Valley, every third person that you're going to meet is a VC. So it's very easy in Silicon Valley to meet angels and VCs. The most important thing, lesson learned here is you have to be super selective about who you take money from. It's as important as you're selecting your employees or your founding team. You have to be, have a very high bar because these are the people that you'll have to stick around with for a long time and they can actually, you know, have a lot of impact, positive or negative, on your business. The next thing is, you know, very important is be prepared to hear no. You know, when you go and pitch your business to investors, you're going to hear no. When I, even though my previous startup was my third company, because I had such a radical idea about this micropayments and virtual goods, I was rejected by 60 VCs. Think about it, you know, going to 60 people and they saying no to you. And how do you feel about it? You feel so discouraged. But you know, the, here the key lesson learned is that you, know, you do not have to be discouraged. You have to learn the objections. That's very important. When people say no to an idea, no for investing, the most important thing is learn what is their objection. Because that's going to help you to do the course correction and fine tuning of your idea. Also very important to keep your enthusiasm at the same level is that you have to think that if they're not investing, it's their loss. Okay? Because, you have, because some of the investors and VCs, I can tell you, is they're dumber than what you think. You know? I, I had a lot of VCs who didn't, get, who didn't understand you know, what my business plan is. And later on, when I was doing my Series A, those were the same investors who were lining up, and we had an oversubscribed uh, funding for the, for the first round. And also very important that you have to be courageous enough to say no. So you know, set a very high bar, and you know, just, it's not about just hearing no, but also ability to say no. And the last thing, you know, assuming that you're lucky enough with all the funding, you have to scale the business. And the most important thing here is all about execution, execution, and execution. So you put your heads down and you just execute, you know, like becoming a caveman and looking at every single aspect of your business in smallest detail. And you know, what I call here is having this mindset of truth seeking as opposed to social coherence. And what it means is that you know, each one of your, your key team members have to be a seeker of truth in terms of you know, what really the market wants, what really your customer wants, how really you know, the people are delivering to what the vision, what the goal is. And you know, the moment you lose that truth seeking uh, mindset and you become more like social coherence, yeah, I want to, I like this person or I, you know, is a friend of mine, that doesn't work to help scale the business. The next thing is, you have to be thinking about that you know, you're building something which is much bigger than yourself. So it can't be a reflection of the, the founder's ego. And when you look at your business and you're scaling, the sum has to be always equal, is always has to be much greater than the part. Because otherwise you're not building it. So it's a, the math that you learn here which in school, which is 2 plus 2 equals 4. In business, it has to become 2 plus 2 equals 5. Okay? Otherwise, you know, the math's not working. <laughs> The, the other thing um, is also very important is at some point in your business, you have to pause selling. Because yeah, you know, you're excited about your idea, you're excited about your product, but you can't just constantly sell and evangelize. You have to pause and give the market, give the customer of yours, whoever is using your product, give them a chance and watch them and observe that they are taking, they are being the ambassador and they are growing your business. It's like, it's called a viral coefficient in the, in the consumer business. You have to see that your product or your service has virality. That when, you, when one of your first customer is using your service, they are telling 10 other customers, so they are bringing that. It's just not you are selling constantly because then you are going to only hear your noise level and you're going to miss out the signal that you're getting from the market. It doesn't mean that you have to fire all your salespeople, but you, know, you have to pause at times. And finally, uh, one thought is you know, that success really is a combination of many, many small things that are done right. 
It's not like one silver bullet. It's not like I did one this great thing, I have this fabulous idea or this great market, no. Success is, is optimizing every single smallest little parameters and making sure they are happening. And they all happen at the right time. And that's why attention to detail. We all, we all admire Steve Jobs, but we also know that he was a stickler to attention to detail. He would sit in every meeting till late night making sure the smallest little thing about the iPads or the iPhones is working perfectly. Right? It's whether it's mechanical design, whether it's electrical design, whether it is software, whether it is user interface, it, the attention to detail is super important because without that you cannot execute uh, or bring a great product or a great company to the market. So I would conclude my remarks uh, or my talk here by the final thoughts here, which is that entrepreneurs are unreasonable. So it's very important that you be unreasonable because you will have to have the confidence, the courage, and the conviction to challenge the status quo. You cannot bring a change. You cannot bring an innovation unless you have the courage to challenge the status quo. And that's why this is a very famous quote and my favorite one, George Bernard Shaw said that reasonable people adapt to the world. Unreasonable people attempt to adapt the world to themselves. So all progress of humankind depends on the unreasonable people. Thank you and we'll be happy to take questions.